Don't you find it amazing that God came here? Isn't that weird? <laughs> he came here. He's beyond time. He's beyond physical existence. He's above it all. He holds it all in the palm of his hand. He, he, he just came here. He made here. He came here. This little backwater planet in the middle of nowhere. But on this planet, he placed his, what he calls his, the apple of his eye, his jewel, crown jewel, his, his people. He placed us here. And he took on flesh and came here as one of us. It's even more amazing. How easy to defeat Satan coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but he didn't come that way the first time. He'll come that way the second time, amen, when he comes back. But the flesh is Satan's playground. And Jesus came in the flesh to defeat the prince of this world, Satan. Meek, humble, lowly, weak, a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, susceptible to everything that a baby is susceptible to, guarded by two parents who were shunned, really, by society, you know, because of the nature of Christ's birth. People didn't know the truth, so they assumed the worst, right? Isn't that the way it is? People don't know the truth, they assume the worst, right out of the gate. That's how people are. Jesus came of such low and humble estate and won a massive victory. He came and executed his plan perfectly. It, it just astounds me. And we ought to be so grateful for that. We know that like no one else knows that. We, God's people, know that fact like no one else knows it. Yet at Christmas time, we lose that fact sometimes, don't we, in commercialism and everything else. The Christ child, he might live in our mantle, but he's not really in our hearts much, and we just get through Christmas. Who's ever had that thought? I'm just going to get through Christmas this year. <laughs> yeah, that's right, you can admit to it. I know you're thinking, oh, let's get through. Let's just get through Christmas. But let's take a look. Jesus comes. Two kingdoms are going to react. And we're going to look at those two kingdoms reacting to the Christ child coming. Let's read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. He came to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. I mean, there's scandal right there in that statement, betrothed and with child. That wasn't common. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and giving us a chance. Thank you for coming in grace and mercy. You've given us two millennia of opportunity to come to you and be saved. You have showered grace on this planet. And so few recognize it. When you come again, there won't be any doubts. When you come again, there won't be any questions. When you come again, opportunity will be gone. Accounts will be finally settled. The victory will be finally won. The camps will be distinct. Those who love you and those who hate you. Those are the two camps. You'll make distinction based on faith in you. And you will execute judgment on some, many, and mercy on many. Thank you. 
Thank you that at some point in time you awakened me through the power of the Holy Spirit to know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. My prayer for the world is that everyone would know that truth. My prayer for the world is that all of us would have the gospel on our lips and that you would use us, your humble servants, your people, to spread truth and mercy and the grace of God to the lost and dying world. And we pray, Lord, that they would come running for salvation. We pray for a great awakening. We pray for a great, what we call, revival. We pray for a movement of you, sweet Holy Spirit, to call many to your, your name. Let us see that in our generation, Father, please. But we commend all things to your hand because you are the wisest. We commend all things to your hand because you are the best and the greatest and the only one who can manage this whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look today at the reaction of two kingdoms to Jesus' arrival. Both are under God's sovereign leadership, by the way. There's not one kingdom that flaunts itself before God and runs around willy-nilly doing whatever it wants. God owns it all, amen? He's the king of all things. He is the ruler of all things. He allows, for a moment, Satan to have his little authority. Even Jesus said it of him, the ruler of this world comes, but he has nothing in me, Jesus said. He told that to his disciples. So the ruler of the world came, and he was no threat to Christ. Not really. Amen? Not really. Have you seen that picture on the internet where it's Satan on one side of the table and Jesus on the other side of the table and they're arm wrestling? Has anyone seen that picture? Nope. It's not an even contest. When Satan comes face to face with Jesus, he will be destroyed <laughs> with a thought in a moment, judged, cast into hell, where he doesn't rule in hell, by the way. He's bound there to suffer for eternity, for his audacity to raise himself up against Yahweh the Most High. He will burn for eternity. All these people that think they're going to go to hell and party with their friends have no concept of God, no concept of the two kingdoms, no concept of what Scripture says. Some fool said he'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Maybe that was Nietzsche. I can't remember who it was. It doesn't matter. He knows now. He knows now. Jesus is the king. But for now... We labor around on this planet where the principality, where the accuser has some authority, only the authority God gives him. He hasn't taken anything from God, amen? He hasn't stolen anything from God. All he did was raise himself up against God, and then he was cast out of heaven. And he was given the authority to deceive the nations for a time. To weed out the believer from the non-believer. So the people would make their true colors known. That's what Satan is here for. That's why God allows it. So people's true colors will be known. You either follow me, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, or you follow Him. Make your colors known. And people do it every day. We see it every day, don't we? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. In those days means the days in which John the Baptist and Jesus were foretold. It's the days in which John the Baptist and Jesus were born. It's, it's, it's the days when the kingdom came. The kingdom of God came. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God came. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God was realized. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God was complete. When Jesus came, the kingdom of God visited earth. Amen? Wow! Oh. And a census was called around all the time Quir Quirinius. I have such trouble with that name. I would never name my kid that. Quirinius, get in here. It'd be so hard to yell in anger. A census was called. And Joseph and Mary journeyed from the little town of Nazareth, where they lived, to the town in which Joseph, son of Heli, that's Joseph, the, what do you want to call him, stepfather of Jesus, <laughs> Mary's husband, was born. Bethlehem. That's where he was born. But more importantly, Joseph was a son of David. 
He was of the lineage of David. This was the city of David. Mary was of the lineage of David also. And there are many prophecies in Scripture that say that the King of kings and the Lord of lords will come in flesh and be sit on the throne in the lineage of David. God executes His plans perfectly. It was important that Jesus be born in the city of David and in the lineage of David to fulfill God's Word. God promised King David one of his heirs would always sit on the throne of the people of Israel, the tribes of Judah. The ten tribes, the lost tribes, didn't really worship Yahweh. But the southern tribes, God kept in his hand. They were ruled over by David and David's lineage. And God kept them in faith. And he kept them faithful in their hearts. And he kept them, his own people, redeemed. It was important that Jesus be born of the lineage of David. Many, God, many times God wanted to destroy Judah for their disobedience, but He didn't. He relented, Scripture says. Why? Because He made a promise to David, and our God keeps every one of His promises. Amen? Every one. He's never slipped, not once, not on one promise. All of God's promises are yes in Jesus. Scripture says God is a promise keeper. He will keep every promise. We get into error when we start making claims on God's promises that He never made, and then the whole world slides off to the left or to the right because they, they're presuming things from Scripture that God never promised and they don't get them. That's a different message. That's not today's. So let's take a look. A couple ways here that God promised. Speaking to King David through Nathan the prophet, Yahweh said in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16, He said, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up... Listen for Jesus in this now. I will raise up your offspring after you, David, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, we think of King Solomon when we're reading this, but look forward to Christ as well. Listen. He shall build a house for my name. Did King Solomon build a house for God's name? It took him seven years to build God's house. It took him how many? Thirteen some, and some change to build his own house. He spent twice as long building his own house, King Solomon did, as building the temple to God. But nonetheless, he built the temple of God. Is not Jesus Christ building a temple to God? We are the temple of His body. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We who are born again and redeemed of God are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are His building. We are His field. We are His. Amen? We're His. And He's building us into a mighty kingdom. I will establish the throne of His kingdom forever. I will be to Him a Father. Oh, man. If you can't see the Gospel in here, you're not looking very hard. And He shall be to me a Son. My steadfast love will not depart from Him as I took it from Saul whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Amen. Now that's a promise worth keeping. But in a verse more common around the Christmas season, let's read this again, this promise in Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. God said this through Isaiah the prophet. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. His name shall be called Mighty God. His name shall be called Everlasting Father. This is a great argument against the Mormons here for Jesus is different than God. No, he's not. Jesus is also the Everlasting Father. His name shall be called Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. So the journey is, this little journey that we read about is how God fulfilled his promises and kept his word. It was probably a seven day journey. It's about 90 miles. They had to skirt Samaria, as if you can see up there. They had to skirt Samaria in the middle. No self-respecting Jew would come into contact with any Samaritans. So whenever they traveled from the north to the south, they had to skirt around Samaria so as not to become unclean on their journey to the holy city. Let's take a look at Luke 2, verses 6 through 7. And while they were there, that's Bethlehem. That's at the lower end of that little blue line, that, that little journey. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Here's where all of our 
Christmas traditions kind of break from the truth when we think about the manger that Jesus was laid in. You might think of the manger out in the middle of nowhere, because this is what I think of it, because it always looks that way. You've got the little thing on the mantle, the little house thing, and it's all open where the cold breezes can blow through, and then there's Jesus in the manger. Man- manger comes from the word manje. It means to eat. The manger is the little trough that the little animals eat out of. That- that's what the manger is. And so Jesus is laid in this little trough, and we're thinking it must have been freezing out there, all alone, all in the empty, and and by themselves, shunned by the city. <laughs> you know, that's what we think. We envision Mary and Joseph and Jesus freezing in a barn with no walls because our things on our mantle never have walls. They're being turned away at every hotel in town. Well, that's 20th century thinking imposing itself on first century Middle Eastern culture. It's not the way it worked. Remember, they went to Bethlehem. They didn't go to some field outside of Bethlehem. They went to Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a city. The hustle and bustle of Bethlehem was going and coming. The census was on them. People were all over. The city was filled. Elizabeth had relatives there. She just visited. I mean, Mary had relatives there. She had just visited Elizabeth and Zechariah, the father of of John. She knew people in the area. The, The place was filled with, the place was a city. Any son of David who came into the city of David wouldn't be turned away. If you turned away a son of David, when they came to your house for hospitality, you'd be shunned by the rest of society. You'd be laughed at. If you turned away a pregnant woman at your door, you would be shunned by the rest of society. It didn't happen. and for, They were very hospitable. If you came wanting something, they would make a room for you. If you. All those passages you read in Scripture, if your neighbor knocks on your door asking for this, asking for that, give it to him. You're like, why would my neighbor come to my door? Because that's what they did. And they showed hospitality. Nobody turned away. There was no hotel in town with no vacancy sign outside in neon saying, no, Jesus, you can't come in here. It didn't work that way. What is going on here? Jesus wasn't even probably born the night they arrived, we think that he was. Let's let's see what it says here. Verse 6, And while they were there, for the duration, the time came for her to give birth. It wasn't necessarily the night they arrived. Joseph had plenty of time to make arrangements. Plenty of time to knock on doors. He knew people in town. He was from there. He was from there. So the word often translated in actually means guest room. And if you look up on the screen there, you can see how a typical house was laid out. This is a house. Sometimes the guest room was upstairs. Sometimes the guest room was on the end. You have the main living area in the middle, and then you have the stable, which is attached to The house. Can everyone see that okay up on the screen? So the animals at night, they would be brought into the stable which was attached to the house. Can you imagine the wonderful, odiferous time that people had trying to get to sleep there? And they would stick their heads, those animals would, through a cutout in the wall and eat out of the manger. So they're in the nice warm house and they would just stick their little cow head through and they would eat out of that manger, little holes cut in the ground. The home in which they stayed probably looks something like this. With, that's, a, that's the cutout also. You can see the little the cattle over there in the stable poking their head through and eating in the manger, the main guest room. All that this is saying, all Scripture tells us, is that the guest room was occupied. So the home that they stayed in, the guest room was occupied. So they said, you can't stay in the guest room. We'll make a room for you in our main living area. And when the baby came, they laid him in the manger right there in the nice warm house, nice with hospitality and all that. It's just a different, the reality is far different from the fairy tale. God provided for his son a warm home to be born in, in the middle of town, surrounded by people, populated. So, It would have been the height of shame and subjected a person to public scorn if they had turned away the son of David with a pregnant wife. Just wasn't done. Just wasn't done. So Jesus was laid in the manger, but that's again only because the guest room was occupied. He and his family were warm and well cared for. So let's take a look at how the heavenly host reacts. Let's take a look here. Read with me Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And in the same region... There were shepherds out in the field. Now, they were out in the field, okay? Jesus was in town. The shepherds were way out in the field taking care of their sheep. It was warm. It wasn't snowing. The shepherds weren't out in the field all night when it was freezing cold outside. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. 
And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Can you imagine? The sky opens up. The heavenly host is there. All of a sudden, you're just with the sheep, and then you're with the heavenly host. The heavenly host, who is that? That's the spirit beings created by God that dwell in heaven with him. It's the spirit realm dwellers that God has created. All of a sudden, we think the sky opened up. I don't know if the sky opened up. Something opened up, and all of a sudden, there's this chorus of them standing there in the middle of nowhere. It must have freaked them out. I mean, really freaked them out. Esther, Ethel, I'm coming type moment from Sanford and Son. I mean, it must have really... Elizabeth, wasn't her name Elizabeth? I'm coming, Elizabeth. That's what it was. <laughs> coming, Elizabeth. But the angel said to them, fear not. That's what angels have to say because they freak us out when we see them. Okay, fear not. Fear not. Jesus said fear not all the time. When he walked on the water, it's a ghost. He's like, fear not. It's me. When angels would show up, they would always say, fear not. When we see angels, we are going to be struck with fear and trembling because they're beings that we're not used to seeing. And I've said this before, but I, I like it, so I'm going to say it again. If we were to see ourselves in our glorified bodies that we're going to get, we would fall down and want to worship who we're going to be in Christ, what we're going to look like. If we saw ourselves after our death with our glorified bodies, we would want to fall down and worship because light emanating, the glory of God emanating from us. Man, I'm telling you, it is going to be awesome. The glory of God, and no darkness. Where we go, because the light of Christ is shining through us. We are bringing His light and His message and His truth and His power. We, we are vessels for the Christ. Oh my goodness, it is going to be a good life. Amen, it's going to be a good life. It's going to be a good life. Let's read. Okay. They were filled with great fear. Verse 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, who we've talked about weeks and weeks past, Praising God and saying, not singing, not singing. It doesn't say singing. It says saying and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Shouting the praises and the glory of God. That's how loyal heavenly hosts behave. Those who are faithful to Christ. That's how they behave. There are two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of those who are faithful to to God who love and worship Him. And then there's the kingdom of God-haters. Those are the two kingdoms on the planet. We see both kingdoms manifest in the Spirit, and we see both kingdoms manifest in the flesh. And we're looking at the two varied responses. Let's take a look at how the disloyal heavenly host reacts. Because it wasn't just these guys, was it? Isn't there an enemy? Do you believe that the enemy is real? Do you believe that the principality of the enemy is real? Do you believe that? You must. If you really do understand the victory that we have in Christ, you must understand what this is. Let's take a turn back to Revelation 12, verse 1. Revelation 12, verse 1. This is how the disloyal heavenly host react. The emissaries and compadres and cohorts of Satan. This is how they act at the birth of the Christ child. Those loyal to God, those loyal to Christ are singing His praises, announcing His coming, rejoicing at the opportunity to serve with human beings, to be part of God's complete kingdom, but not these guys. Here we go. Revelation 12, 1-6. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and her head was a crown of twelve stars. That's the twelve tribes of Israel. This is Israel. She was pregnant. Jesus is born out of Israel, amen? He's born of the lineage of David, the people of God, Israel. That's who this represents. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and seven horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of the heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon, here's his reaction. The dragon, Satan and his, and his demonic forces stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Jesus, Satan wanted to kill the Christ child from the womb. He spent the 33 years of Jesus' life trying to kill him so that he could not redeem God's people. There was war 
for the 33 and some odd years of Jesus' life. Satan was trying to kill him. Satan was trying to stop him. Because if Jesus wins, Satan loses. Amen? This is real. This is real. She gave birth to a male child who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to His throne. All right, what's that? That's Jesus' crucifixion and Jesus' resurrection and Jesus' ascension to the right hand of the Father. That fast. That fast in eternity. Jesus is born, accomplishes what He's supposed to accomplish, is crucified, dies, lays in the ground for three days, testifies to the spirits in prison that He is King of kings and Lord of lords, walks through the halls of death, proclaiming life, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and in eternity, blink of an eye. Blink of an eye. And Satan missed his chance. Amen, didn't he? He did the best he could. Jesus wins. And we ought to all, not, I'm not saying go get a tattoo, but we ought to all have a tattoo on it. It says Jesus wins now. Jesus wins. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she was in a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. That's the diaspora. That's the people of God moving out into the nations. That's the people running from the persecution. It's everything that we've seen in history. It's everything we see now. It's everything happening now. The people of God fleeing. And then Jesus bringing the people of God home. The story is so consistent from Genesis to Revelation. It's the story of God's victory and Him reclaiming His people from the kingdom of darkness. Amen. That is what Christmas is about. That's how the heavenly host reacted. Let's see how the enemies of God on earth reacted. Go all the way back to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. How did the members of Satan's kingdom on earth react? to the birth of the Christ? How did what we just read in Revelation 12 get fulfilled? How did the dragon try to kill the Christ child? Through an arrogant, pompous king who served only himself. And when we serve only ourselves, who do we serve? The enemy. When we serve ourselves, we serve Satan. There's no two ways about it. When we serve anything except Christ, we serve Satan. No matter what we call the idol, we're serving Satan. He's the enemy. So let's take a look. Matthew 2, verses 13 through 18. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there, remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about... See, they know. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. This is how Satan tried it. And he rose, and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under. Imagine that for a second. Just think about that. He killed all the male children in Bethlehem. Soldiers going door to door, ripping open doors, finding children under two, and grabbing them up and driving a sword through them, all to try and kill the Christ child. Those who serve in public service need to take lesson from this. That's especially, maybe I'm the only one, okay, maybe I'm the only one that needs to listen to this. When the government tells you to do something that God explicitly says is sin, will you lose your job before you do that thing? I wrestle with that every day. Will I lay my badge on the altar of Christ and walk away when I am commanded to take the rights of the people away from them? That's something you've got to deal with. Am I courageous enough to trust in Christ and choose Him over finances? And this is a question for all of us. Will I choose Him over finances? Will I choose Him over relationships? Will I choose Him over comfort? Will, when everything hangs in the balance, will I choose my testimony over my happiness? Will I? Will I really? It's never an easy decision, though, is it? It's never an easy decision. These soldiers must have been conflicted, but Herod wasn't. Herod wasn't. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that had been ascertained from the wise men. How tragic. 
the population of Bethlehem wasn't like the population of Chicago, but you're, you're talking about dozens and dozens of babies being murdered just in Bethlehem. And then you're talking about hundreds of babies being murdered in the surrounding towns in Judea. Does that bring anything to mind? The wholesale slaughter of 3,000 babies a day in this country is an abomination before God. And while we're not all taking part in it, are we praying hard enough against it, you know? Nah, I don't want to get into an America thing. Amer America is not the people of God. <laughs> America is not the church. I've said it before, God's not an American. Okay? God's God. And our nation is either going to honor him or we're not going to honor him. That's it. Those are the two choices. It's the two choices. And right now we're not honoring him at all. This country is not honoring our King of Kings and Lord of Lords at all. The decisions we make, the laws we pass, the things we enforce, the freedoms we take, He's not looking at America going, now that's how I wanted it done. Pray more. Amen. That's right. Pray more. Pray more for salvation to ring out. Amen. Isn't that right? Pray more for the kingdom to be born in people's hearts. Pray more that the leaders in this country would surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and start serving and glorifying Him rather than themselves and their own stinking legacy. Oh man. Hold on. Let me move that soapbox over. So this is how the world reacts. And God prophesied it in verse 18 of Matthew 2. The voice was heard in Ramah, that's Bethlehem, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel, Bethlehem, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. They're no more on earth. Right? Isn't that a key thing to understand about the kingdom of God? They're no more on earth, but they live in the kingdom of God, amen? They're no more on earth, but they live with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and their pain is over. And I, I believe with every ounce of what I have to believe with, that on Judgment Day, all of those aborted babies will stand and condemn everyone who aborted them, who's unrepentant, who's unrepentant. But I also believe this, every aborted baby will stand with open arms and welcome the parent who repents and comes to Jesus Christ who aborted them. They will say, welcome home, sister. Welcome home. I love you. Welcome home. If you've had an abortion and you're a Christ follower, you are forgiven. You're forgiven. We have a God who is slow to anger and quick to forgive. Amen? Repentance is the key. Jesus is the key. I'm forgiven for my sins because of the blood of Christ. You're forgiven for your sins because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. It's all we claim. It's the only hope that we have. My sins are no worse than yours. Yours are no worse than mine. It is just the fact that we do not honor God with our lives. So Jesus Christ came to live the perfect, sinless life so that by placing our faith in Him, we get credit for His righteousness. The more you think about it, the more thankful you've got to be. Amen? Isn't it true? The more thankful you've got to be. So people who belong to Satan's domain react by trying to kill the Christ. Let's see how people who are loyal to Yahweh react. Let's look at Luke 2, 15. Back over to Luke. Luke 2, 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, and they changed their frock, you know they had to do that, man. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Remember, in our minds we always have them out wandering into the desert. They didn't wander off into the wilderness. They were in the wilderness. They came into the city. 
They came into the city and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. The first thing they want to do is share it. Amen? Isn't that right? That people, people of the kingdom of God, when we have a realization about God, when we are rejoicing in God, we want to share it. That's what the people in the kingdom of God do. We share Jesus. Verse 16. And they went in haste, and they found Mary and Joseph. They had to ask around, right? Hey, was there a, a baby born in town? Was there a baby born in a manger? Because they were told. Does anyone have it knocking door to door? Has there been a baby born in town? Has there been a bit? They caused a ruckus. These shepherds, these nobodies, because shepherds were nobodies in the eyes of even the people of Israel. They were nobodies. And they're in town banging on doors. They're like, who are these crazy people? No, there's not been no baby born here. Get out of my, get off my porch. You know, so they're knocking. They went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby living in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. When the shepherds came in from the fields, and when they're knocking on doors, and people say, why are you knocking on my door? They are making known to everyone in the city what they heard from the angels. The Savior has been born in town. The Savior has been born in town. He's laying in a manger. Has anyone seen the Savior? The Son of David. He's been born in our town. Can you imagine the ruckus? And all who heard it wondered. Verse 18, all that heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. People have one of four reactions to the gospel when we proclaim to them as Christians what we believe and what we know. It's up there on the screen for you. One of four reactions. We're going to see a couple of them here. We don't see all of them here. The first reaction is they disbelieve, they don't believe any of it, and they oppose it at the same time. They hate you for having that message. Who's ever met like a militant atheist? They just You hear about them more in the news probably than you see them. They want prayer taken out of the Congress. They want the Ten Commandments taken down out of the courthouses. They, they want crosses taken out of Arlington Seminary. The, a seminary. Cemetery. Sometimes seminary and cemetery is pretty similar. They, 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 they want every aspect of God taken out of culture. You've heard of them in the news. That's these people. They hate God. They hate Him and they hate His people. They say they don't believe in Him, but we know they're lying, don't we? From Romans what? one eighteen. Men are without excuse. Men are without excuse. Everything that can be known about God is obvious about God from creation. Men are without excuse. So even if they say they really don't believe, they do. That's why they're so upset. That's why they're so upset. So first, they disbelieve and they oppose. Second, they believe and oppose. They believe the message, but they don't follow Christ. Isn't there a difference? Doesn't Scripture say you believe that God is one? Good. Even the, the demons believe that God is one and tremble. The demons believe and tremble. People believe the gospel. There are people walking the planet who believe Jesus was born. They believe he was crucified. And probably just from evidence, they believe that he was resurrected. But they don't follow him. And they will never kneel to that God. There are people like that in society. They believe, but they choose not to follow. That's the second kind. The third is the agnostic. They're unconvinced and they wonder. That's who these people were. But Mary, uh, Verse 18, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. There are people who wonder. They're unconvinced. They don't embrace or oppose it. They, oh, that's interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> Have you ever shared your faith with someone? Oh, that's good for you. Good. I'm glad you believe something. That's nice. And they're not pandering to you. They just don't believe. They, they, don't, they don't know. They haven't looked at the evidence, they just don't know. They're, they're unconvinced. That, okay. And then there's the fourth kind. They believe and they embrace Christ. That's it. Well, you're going to run into one of those four things. Here's the thing and why we never give up on people. People can move from one, two, three into four at any moment, and we have no idea when that's going to be. Amen. Isn't that right? The most staunch atheist who's screaming to take prayer out of schools can have an encounter with Christ that transforms that woman and they flip 180 and all of a sudden... That happened to somebody really important in Scripture. Paul! I seem to have read that somewhere. Paul was going to kill Christians. Met Jesus, whack! He arrived in the same town where he was going to kill Christians, and he's professing Christ. And they're like, this guy has, his cheese has done slipped off his cracker. This guy has lost his mind. <laughs> I stole that line from the Green Mile. That's from the Green If you've seen the Green Mile, you're wondering what movie that's from. That's what it's from. It's kind of discouraging. Most of my culture is from movies. It's sad. It's really just sad. Ten Commandments is a good one. The old one. Not the new Noah. Not the Moses. The, not, the old one. 
what, <laughs> but yeah, the, the original Ten Commandments. Cecil B. DeMille, right? Yeah, Ten Commandments. Yeah. All right, let's take a look. But Jesus seals the fate of both kingdoms. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter what kingdom you're in. Jesus seals your fate. All right? Whatever kingdom you belong to, you will kneel before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It's going to happen. He seals the fate of both kingdoms. Satan ain't, gonna wait, ain't getting away with nothing. Amen? Uh, on Judgment Day, those who are adamantly against Christ aren't going to have a thing to say. They're going to kneel before the Lord and acknowledge that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. It's, and we're going to be there to see it. It's going to be a great day. For us, and a horrible day for the other kingdom. But it will happen. So let's take a look. Luke 2, verses 22 through 24. Luke 2, verses 20, 22 through 24. And I, did, I missed reading part of it, but we're going to go ahead to where we are here. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Purification, it was the, the woman who had the baby had to wait eight days and then they had to come into the temple and they had to pay a price to be purified and the child was circumcised. And when the time came, verse 22, for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem, Jesus, to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Remember what I said a couple of weeks ago. Jesus isn't just winning in the physical realm. He's winning in the spiritual realm, too. Let's take a look at Galatians 4, 4 through 5. It ought to be on the screen uh, for you. Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus perfectly kept the law. We just read it. He, he was born to a woman, born in flesh, kept the law. Taken to the temple, offerings made for him, sacrifices made, everything was done according to the law. Jesus perfectly kept the law. And he had to be born under the law because we are under the law. He had to perfectly keep the law because we can't keep the law. He had to perfectly abide by the standard God lays down, which is the law. Only perfect things get into heaven. Amen? Only part, that's the law. The law says if you infract one part of the law, you've broken all of the law, and you are worthy of condemnation. That's any sin, anywhere, big, small, medium, any sin, you've broken the whole law. We are in a bad place apart from Christ because we've all broken the law. So he was born under the law, and he perfectly kept the law. How do we get out? Well, God killed the firstborn of all the unbelievers in Egypt, didn't he? The angel of death came through and he took the firstborn. But what happened to the other kingdom? The faithful kingdom. The kingdom of people that believed in Yahweh. The faithful kingdom that trusted in Yahweh. What did they do? Does anyone remember? They covered their door with blood. And the angel of death passed through society. And he saw two kingdoms. The kingdoms that trusted the Lord in the kingdom that didn't. That's all he saw. The kingdom that trusted the Lord was covered in the blood of the perfect lamb. Amen? The kingdom that didn't trust the Lord didn't bother with covering their doors with the blood. Here's something interesting. There were Egyptians that trusted the Lord. Getting into the kingdom of God has nothing to do with what religion you belong to, what your ethnicity is, the color of your skin, the way you talk, how much money you make, good works that you've done, bad things that you've done. It's not an issue of that. It's, have you surrendered to Jesus Christ? Are you covered by the blood of the perfect Lamb? If you're covered by the blood of the perfect Lamb... The angel of death is going to pass over you, sister. The angel of death is going to pass over you, brother. You've got nothing to worry about. All because of his glory. So Jesus was born subject to the law and kept every part of the law so that we can be adopted into his kingdom through faith and receive what's called his imputed righteousness and be spared of death. Jesus perfectly kept the law, like I said. So, we've seen how citizens of Satan's principality treat Jesus. Let's look now how true believers 
members of God's kingdom respond to him. Luke 2.25, and we're going to close with this. Luke 2.25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Waiting for God to fulfill His word. No doubt that God would, waiting to see it. Amen? Isn't that where we ought to be? No doubt. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. No doubt that's us. If we're in Christ, the Holy Spirit is upon you, brother. The Holy Spirit is upon you, sister. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in spirit into the temple, walking in the Spirit. It's great when you're walking in the Spirit. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up, Simeon did, in his arms. He not got to, only got to see the Son of God, he got to hold him. Amen, isn't that awesome? He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Man, when we are in Christ, we can leave this world in peace. Amen, isn't that right? The moment you surrender your life to Christ, death no longer holds any horror for you, no longer any terror for you. You can leave this world in peace. When we go out of the world, I've done a lot of funerals, folks, and I'll tell you, when someone leaves the world in Christ and in peace, that's a whole different funeral than when someone leaves the world and the people in the room don't know what kingdom they stood in. It is a far different funeral. But man, when I go, whew, what, however the Lord takes me, whenever the Lord takes me, I'm going to close my eyes here and I'm going to open my eyes with Him and it is going to be glorious. I have no fear of death. I have no fear of judgment. <laughs> I don't care. Play the movie. Go ahead, play the movie. Have you ever heard that, Jesus? They're going to play a movie of your life? <laughs> horrified. Oh, don't play that. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Everyone cover your eyes. No, no one's going to care about your movie. They're all going to be worried about their movie. Right? But guess what? Guess what movie plays for you, born-again believer? The movie of Jesus' life. Isn't that great to know? How are you getting into heaven? Well, uh, 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 him. Him. He's the one. Roll the movie. Cecil B. DeMille. Right, and there goes the life of Jesus Christ. And I get credit for all of it. it man, what a gift. Amen. Is that a Christmas gift we can be excited about? Verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Have you seen the salvation of the Lord? that you prepared in the presence of all peoples, right in the middle of Bethlehem, right in the middle of everything, you just dropped right in, as if you own the joint, because you do. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's us, and for the glory for your people, Israel. Brothers and sisters, when you see a great awakening amongst the people of Israel, you know the final days are coming in. When those boys start rolling into the kingdom, and it's happening now, there are missionaries over in Israel, and people are come, thousands upon thousands of Jewish people are coming to faith in Christ every year. And it is starting. And I'm telling you, I'm, tell, I'm just saying, good things are afoot. Amen? Good things are afoot. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Can you imagine the pressure? I'm raising God. Are you kidding me? And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Whether you fall or rise, ladies and gentlemen, depends on how you view Jesus Christ. And for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Only moms know that kind of pain. Seeing your child suffer. So that thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You know, you can tell me you're a Christian all day long and all night long, and you can do a lot of good works, but the thoughts of your heart are revealed in the way that you talk about Jesus Christ. When a Christian can't tell me about Jesus Christ, i got to doubt that they're a Christian at all. When they have nothing on their lips to say about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When they can't talk about the slightest, as a grown-up, kids are different. Kids are different. But when they can't talk about Jesus and what he's done, and you can't hear that adoration in their voice, and you can't hear the idea that they know that they've been redeemed, and that doesn't come out of them in any capacity. If I can ask someone for their testimony, and they talk for 20 minutes and don't mention Jesus Christ, I've got to share the gospel with that person. Because the thoughts of the heart depend on what you think about Jesus Christ. On that you will be judged, and only that will you be judged. Verse 36, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of uh, Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years. That means old, by the way. Having lived with her husband, I, start, I, I tell people I'm advanced in years now, I don't say old anymore. 
She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and prayer night and day. Wow, that's a great life. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Folks, when you're sharing your testimony, it ought to be far more about God than it is about you. All right? She began praising God. She'd been waiting to see this her entire life. And here it was. Verse 39, finally. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Amen. Amen. Can everyone stand with me? The favor of God is upon Jesus Christ. If you enter into a relationship through faith in Jesus Christ, then the favor of God is upon you. Jesus is the only one who has earned God's favor. My prayer for you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when the music starts, don't hesitate, no pause for the cause, no second thought, come forward. Talk to me. Let's pray. Let's make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let's get it done. Let's get you in the right kingdom. Why wait? Again, what are you waiting for? There's no better offer coming. There's no better offer coming. So as the music plays, as the Holy Spirit leads, now is the time for your decision. Father God, we love you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. Heavenly Father, I know there's people within the sound of my voice that don't know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray that you will come to them. I pray that they will place you not just in a guest room, but in a place of prominence in their lives at the head of the table, and they will surrender their lives to you. For those of us who may have lost children, Heavenly Father, I pray that this Christmas season will be the season of their salvation. Father, save people in our presence, please. We ask for the privilege of watching it. We ask for the privilege of being part of it. We'll give you all the glory for it. We love you, Lord Jesus. Bless those who are going to suffer during this Christmas season. Help us to be the light and the salt for them, Heavenly Father. And uh, just make yourself known to all of your people and give us the comfort and peace that passes all understanding. We ask it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Have a wonderful week.